that's the Bhagavad uh, Gita. How would you ex explain, describe yourself to people who doesn't know you or who haven't met you? <laughs> I would describe myself as a South African, uh, a South African who has, because of the history of our country, had to take several roles in my life. Um, so I've been a teacher, I've been uh, an, a diplomat, I've been a, a political activist. Uh, I'm a mother. I've got two sons. My oldest son is 52. My younger son is 32. And um, a family person. Uh, some people describe me as Hugh Masekela's sister. Um, yeah, and I am that too. I'm, um, he's my brother, and we are good friends, and we've always been. Has that, has that been a burden for you to be in your, you yourself with all your own uh, career, political and professional career? Um, based on your own knowledge and skills and expertise. And then people sometimes refer you to... No, I'm very lucky because um, we, 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 we have been, my brother and I are very close and um, we have been friends, you know, and we share the same interests in, in books, in music and so on. And uh, we usually have mutual friends too. We, you know, we've shared friends. Uh, and uh, we've been supportive of each other. So it's, it's, and I lead quite a separate life from his. So it, it hasn't been a burden at all. In fact, sometimes it's, most of the time, it's an advantage because uh, people usually stop me and say, are you related to, you know, you look like, you know, so no, it, it hasn't been a burden here and abroad. It's always been a pleasure because I'm very proud of him and his achievements. And so I'm happy to be associated with him. And I think he is to be with me. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us, if you, if you go a couple of years back mm -hmm. into your own life, um, tell us about the, the Masakela family. Well... Uh, my brother and I are the oldest in the family now. My father was a health inspector and uh, he was above all a sculptor. And uh, my, mother, <clears throat> my mother was a social worker. And we were very lucky because we, uh, my father is from the north is from Limpopo province. My mother was from the Mpumalanga province. We grew up with my grandmother in Whitbank. And then later on, when we were teenagers, we lived with my parents. I went to school in Natal. So we've been very fortunate because we have been exposed to the whole gamut of South African diversity. And uh, so we grew up speaking Afrikaans at my grandmother's house uh, and Ndebele, because she was Ndebele, but also that area, you know, people speak Afrikaans. And um, yeah, and uh, then we, we, in my father's family, they are Northern Sutu, so we are Tlokwas, and we, 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 later on we were able to learn Tlokwa, and we speak Sitokwa, and... Uh, so we consider ourselves very fortunate, you know, because we think that we, we exemplify the diversity of South Africa. Did, did that in any way contribute to you being responsible for the arts and culture of the ANC when you were in Zambia? <clears throat> well, as I say, my father was an artist. My brother became an artist. Um, um, and my mother was a social worker. So we were always involved in the cultural life of Johannesburg. Uh, we grew up in Alexandra Township, among other places. And in our home, we had books, we had music, lots of music. 
My father was uh, a designer. He loved architecture. He loved landscaping. He loved building. Uh, so we grew up in a very, uh, uh, in an environment which encouraged us to know about these things. And um, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, it was natural for me to go into culture. I write poetry and uh, I'm writing a, 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 a memoir right now. Uh, and I've always been good at school in English and I studied literature and I taught uh, literature at university level in the United States. Uh, yeah, so the arts uh, have always been very attractive, you know, to us and part of our upbringing. Well, what's the importance of, of understanding a diversity in a, in a diverse society based on different languages? cultures and people? Well, I think first of all, um, uh, you know, the, the dominant culture in South Africa has been defined by racism, you know, at all levels and at some level ethnicity. And I think that for us having a mother who was colored but who could speak all the South African languages, Nguni and uh, Sutu, um, and who was a social worker and worked in the African community uh, and considered herself as an African. Um, I think we always grew up with that thing, you know, that people always referred to us, you know, out of our hearing, and not only people outside, but... Um, even people within the family always made some remark or other about my mother. Or even now I go into the store and people talk about me and I just say, hey, Gyaru's Gututin, or Gyarudra, Oscar Sevaganna. So, you know, it, it, so we, we, we have had the privilege of uh, experiencing the diversity of South Africa in our personal lives. And uh, I think that it is something that uh, opened us up, not only to our own South African diversity, but to the diversity of world culture. So, uh, <clears throat> and the arts was a natural thing to go to because that's where, you know, you, you, can, you, you can enter the culture of other people through their arts and their crafts and their literature and their theater and their music, you know. So, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, I, I still believe that culture is a very, very important thing and that we are very privileged in South Africa. Of course, it comes, the diversity comes with a lot of issues and problems, but Basically, it's an advantage. And a child growing up, for instance, in Johannesburg, you know, knows at least three or four languages. Uh, unlike a child growing up in Sweden, you know, or in Germany, or in Finland, you know. So uh, I think diversity is, is, is a very, very... Uh, it's a great privilege to be born in a society like that. It also, unfortunately, I think it is also, in our case in South Africa, it, it also exposes you to all kinds of prejudices, you know, which you have to overcome. And you, you overcome them, of course, by identifying you know, by learning languages, being able uh, to communicate with different people, you know. So, yeah, I think diversity is a great thing. It has its problems, you know, but certainly, you know, the South Africans are not one dimensional nationalists who just know their own culture. I think it has even helped us in Africa because uh, we, we have been curious about the cultures of Africa. Mm -hmm. But surely your, your experience as a child 
having two parents mm -hmm. from different cultural um, backgrounds it must have been a burden at times. No, it wasn't. It was just... Um, In an apartheid society where... It was, it, it, it's just that, that you learn to roll with the punches, you know. Um, you know, and I think that uh, one advantage was that I think that it led me into politics because I was attracted by the notion of um, equality, that nobody was less, lesser or better. Um, certainly, uh, I felt pain hearing my mother being referred to, you know, in a certain way, or hearing my mother's relatives referring to my father in a certain way. But my parents were wonderful, talented people. Uh, um, so I think we were just all together very, very fortunate. I think it's quite different for a child, let's say, in, during apartheid, growing up in Coronationville, being surrounded by Africans, but being insulated in, let's say, the colored uh, uh, sensibility, you know, whatever that is. But uh, for us, um, you know, we, we, we were, and also because my mother, who will, would have been a hundred years old next year. My mother grew up before apartheid. She was born in 1917. She went to African schools because at the time you didn't have Bantu education. For instance, my mother went to Kilnatun. Mm -hmm. That's where my parents met, you know. So, um, and my mother spoke Ndebele, Kosa, Zulu, Sutu, everything, Sepedi you know, Afrikaans and English, you know. So it was just, you know, um, it was not difficult in that sense because we were, we were raised to believe that we were equal to everybody and that our lives were important. Mm -hmm. When you were in exile, you were responsible for arts and culture, which in many ways was also a component of the propaganda machinery of the African National Congress, through music, through stage performance, through different activities related to that. Mm -hmm. Give us a... Give us a, a, a I, I, I think I would object very strongly to the, to the characterization as propaganda. It was not propaganda. I think we... we tried to plumb the depths of South African culture and we, we, and the value of it, and we exposed other people to it, and we wanted people to understand our culture. So it was a vehicle, I think, for uh, letting the world know what a great country we came from, what great people uh, we came from who had overcome all kinds of adversities, uh, um, you know, uh, and had always stood up for the dignity of all people in South Africa. Um, so for me to work in the Department of Arts and Culture was really to uh, not only teach South Africans, we even in the ANC, about our culture, but also to expose it to other people. Um, it was a great, it was a great uh, opportunity. Uh, however, I have to say that um, I don't think that in the early days, uh, uh, of our struggle that, you know, the, the, the role of culture was as important as other aspects, whether it was um, struggle, whether, you know, it was um, uh, um, 
you know, economic concerns, whatever. But uh, it is only when we uh, together, because I didn't work alone in the Department of Arts and Culture, I worked with people like Wiley Sarute, Lindy Wemabuza, Mandla Langa, uh, Louise Colvin, lots of, of talented and, and, and passionate people. Um, I think that um, it, 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 it was something we felt could play an even greater role. And I think that when you look at South Africa today, you realize that because I, 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 I think if we had had our way and if culture had been deemed as important, you know, uh, uh, as other aspects, um, I think you wouldn't have a situation where there are children who have no cultural facilities, who have, you know, who are not able to see movies, who are not, who do not have bicycles, who are unable to swim, etc., uh, etc. Et you know, uh, and of course we were responsible for sport as well. Uh, that was part of our mandate, and. Um, I think that it has now been generally accepted that actually culture does play a role in bringing about cohesion in a society. And uh, it's tragic that there are some people who still cannot speak a single African language today in South Africa because you know, I mean, having been in exile for many years, there was nothing as wonderful walking in the street, just hearing somebody speaking Afrikaans. You know, in New York, walking in the street, you just felt like going to say, hey, you know, homegirl or homeboy. Or, and if you had somebody speaking Kosa or Sisutu, you just went overboard because you could then even say, hey, you people, what are you doing here, etc. Et so I think that culture for me is still a very, very important uh, instrument, uh, a vehicle for bringing people together, for bringing about understanding, uh, for sharing, you, for sharing common values, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah. Let's go back to what you said earlier. Um, when I asked you about, given the diversity within your own household, your own mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. mother and father and your brothers and, and uh, the connections that you had with, with different parts of your family. And then you say that you had to roll with the shots. Yeah. Just explain that to somebody listening to this program. What do you mean by a role in religion? Well, I, I think that there are certain epithets that are used, you know, uh, which were painful as a child. You know, words like kafir, words like busman, um, ilawu, you know, uh, uh, which people just used, you know, uh, um, uh, be, not because people were evil, but because the racism, which was, which is part of our society, had influenced them, and many of those people had not been exposed to these other cultures. I think that living in Johannesburg or Cape Town, maybe, or Port Elizabeth, it's a different situation because you are bound in that situation to meet a people from different cultures. But certainly, it could not have been easy for my mother to marry into my father's family. And I think she was a very brave woman to do that. Uh, and that in time, because of her humanity, her kindness, her talents, she was accepted. 
Um, I mean, it's like if your daughter brought a white man to say they're marrying him, you can't just pretend that, no, it's a normal situation, you know. It does cause some uh, anxiety, it does cause uh, some doubts, etc., etc. But uh, once you get in, exposed to, you know, once you, you, you get to know your son-in-law as a human being, and in South Africa we simply did not have the opportunity to get to know each other as human beings. And the evil and crime of apartheid was that not only was this promoted uh, between black and white, but it was promoted even within the black community, you know, where you looked askance at certain people, and mainly your reason for your prejudice was that you didn't know them. You know, you, you didn't know. I mean, I'm sure people in Cape Town never even thought that there were vendors or Zongas in South Africa. And uh, even when I went to school in Johannesburg, etc., you know, it was rare to have a person from Venda, you know, going to school f with you or a person from uh, uh, the Tsonga people coming to school with you. I lived, I grew up in Alexandra. And, uh, uh, you know, with urbanization, you, you, are, you are able to have access to other cultures and other peoples. Because, um, I mean, in Alexandra Township, for instance, we had uh, people from, from the Cape, you know, uh, who worked uh, in, in Alexandra Township. Um, and they worked in the sanitation department. And people looked down on them, you know. Uh, because they, you know, they were night soil, they were called night soil men, you know. People from, from the north were looked down upon. And my father used to tell stories too about them coming from the north and coming to Joburg and working in the mine. So, you know, prejudice was just part and parcel of colonialism and discrimination. And also when people are oppressed, they tend to discriminate against each other too, because um, you know they, 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 you cannot escape being tainted by by the culture of racism. You can't. It affects all of us, and um, <coughs> it's not something that you wipe away, you know, with laws or what. You can't tell people how to how to think, you know. That is a process and that's where culture comes in because through culture you are able to bring people on board and make them understand universal facts, you know, and, 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 and they see themselves as part of the human race, you know, rather than as part of a grouping. Just for, for, for the record, um, when we transcribe, I would like just for you to, so at the beginning, we have your mother and your father's name. My mother's name was, uh, is, was Pauline Bauer. Mm -hmm. Pauline Bauer. Bauer, B-O-W-E-R. Mm -hmm. My father's name was Thomas Masekela. Now, you said, when I asked you earlier about arts and culture and, <coughs> and what comes with it, mm -hmm. the different activities built into a broader understanding of arts and culture, music, art, um, stage performance, etc., as a, a form of propaganda. Mm -hmm. You were saying. No, you don't. It hurts when I hear the word propaganda. I want to jump up and punch you. Which leads me, which leads me to ask you then. Mm -hmm. were, this, you, were your activities not informed by the Department of Information of the African National Congress when it was in England? Surely this would have been a, 
a structural link between there was a link between all the departments mm -hmm. of, of the ANC as they I hope there's a link in all the departments of government today you know uh, um, and um, the Department of Information and Publicity was not only no let me backtrack the department of information and publicity was about giving people the correct information to counteract their information that was rotten that was gi being given by you know the the apartheid government who had a whole system of propaganda and surely to fight that system of, of, of propaganda you have to set up a counter uh, 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 department with different values. Our values were not to say that white people are evil, they are inherently evil, uh, we are superior to them, no. The common thing, the common theme that put us together as freedom fighters was that we belong to the human race and that South Africa belongs to all the people of South Africa and that we are able to achieve as much as any person in the world can achieve and that we want to bring about a society that is totally different from the apartheid society. And every ANC CADA, you know, learnt that. And that's not propaganda. That is reality, you know. Uh, and um, so, uh, I, 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 I would really, you know, I, I would, I would, I, I, I would be at odds with uh, anybody who said that that was propaganda. So what is propaganda? Propaganda is uh, 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 disseminating incorrect, inaccurate information, whether it's racist, sexist, Div, you know, divisive uh, 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 about people, you know, and, and if you, you know, uh, if you look at what we were fighting for, we were fighting for the unity of South Africa. We were fighting for the equality of the sexes. And, and, and those things, as I said earlier, they don't come about automatically. It's easy to sow a seed of sexism or a seed of racism, but to, 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 to destroy the, the plant that comes out of that seed is, 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 is something that is not achieved in a generation. You look at countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, they are still fighting racism you know, today. It is something that we will always have with us, but hopefully in lesser degree, degrees, you know. And we hope that eventually, you know, beyond our own life. It, it, it's one of, you know, as human beings, we aspire to perfection. We never achieve that perfection, but we aspire to it. But that doesn't mean that we have not lived up to our humanity. As long as we have the aspiration to be better, you know, then we have the possibility, you know, and that's, that is the wheel of universal human life, that you are always aspiring falling, rising, falling, rising, but going up. And I think that it's, it's part of life. It's, it, it's the cycle of life. And we measure the success of that uh, by looking at a people, you know, 
Um, that's why, you know, I mean, if you look at racism, it affects the economy. It affects the lives of children. It, it, it permeates the whole society, you know. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge for life. Do we, do we have a, is there a super, super culture? Or, what do you or mean a super people? culture? Do we have a super culture of, or, or, or are all cultures equal? When you in say South we, Africa's, what do you mean? South African society. Is there, is there a, a super culture that, that supersedes and is more powerful than other cultures? Is there, is there a situation where, for instance, if you need to talk to, historically, we're talking put into your historic lens, and you just came out of exile, um, and you were running arts and culture with others, yes? And you come into a society who has for decades been indoctrinated that white people, and in particular Afrikaners, are more superior than any other uh, culture within South African society. Is there something like that, or is it just part of a a machine. What would you ex how would you explain that to young children? And to it's an economic thing. How how do you characterize culture? You characterize culture in terms of facilities people have. You know, social and cultural facilities. You you look at it in terms of the kind of education that they have. You measure it in terms of the kind of housing they have, you know, et cetera, health systems they have, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't know. I don't even want to go into the term superculture because I think it's a dangerous term. I think that you had people who were materially better off because they were of a certain color, you know. I wouldn't call that a superculture. And I think it's precisely uh, uh, that we did not come in to say that, uh, you know, we are better. We said South Africa is a diverse country. It has many cultures. All of them are, are of great value and we must share in them because they enrich all of us and make us a better society. Hence, because if you look at the totality of culture, if it's not only about performance, you know, it's not about performance, it's not about product, producing books. Culture is the entire manner in which a society, you know, uh, uh, carries out its human functions, everything, you know. So uh, um, uh, whether it's health, whether it's, it's cal you know, performing arts, uh, whether it's work laws, you know, uh, where, you know, crafts, you know, that is all culture. And because we have these many cultures, just think how much wealthier we are. And if we look at the practice of uh, plastic culture in South Africa today, what we see is that actually there is that melding taking place. You do find that people are appropriating, not I shouldn't use the word appropriating, but they are claiming things that are made, that are said, that have been said because they're saying it was done, in, it, it came out of our country, so it is ours. It can't belong to you because you are white or because you, you are of Asian extraction or because you come from the Eastern Cape. Umpako is mine too, you know, and I can wear it. And, but also, I think very importantly for me in the crafts, when you look at crafts in South Africa today, uh, you see that uh, 
our our compatriots, our white compatriots, our Asian compatriots, ourselves. We are all, you know, taking <clears throat> from the different streams of South African culture, and we are busy creating a new South Africa. And you know, I mean, I think that what 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 you have here is that people expect that something will emerge tomorrow and you'll be able to say it weighs so much, it measures. It's not, it's an evolving thing which manifests itself in different ways. And, and, and I think we're getting there. I'm actually very optimistic about South Africa. And I'm, compared to the time, let's say 1990 when the, the, the political, um, organizations were unbanned to now, I think we've come a long, long way. You know, we, we've come a long way. We have filmmakers, we've got uh, fashion designers, we've got writers, uh, we've got economists, we've got all, it's all this is South African culture and it's evolving. And, you know, our, 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 our task is to make sure that we accelerate that evolution. And there are some people who are always trying to slow it down, to retard that, 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 that evolution. Who called you to say that you're going to work now with former President Nelson Mandela? He asked me to work with him. Tell us about that experience. What did he say to you? I was, um, when um, Utatu Mandela came out uh, of prison, the one of the first trips he took was to the United States. And um, I was, because I'd been in, and I've always been in the ANC since I was about 16. I'm 75 now. And um, I was asked to be in the advance team that prepared for the trip of uh, Tatu Mandela to go to, 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 to America because I had lived and worked in the United States and I'd been an activist in the United States in the anti-apartheid movement and in the ANC. It was felt that I would be able to make a valid contribution to the success of the trip. And during that trip, you know, uh, which was, a ma you know, we went to all the major cities. I mean, it was just a historical thing, just a mind-blowing experience. Uh, at the end of that trip, uh, Mr. Mandela asked me if I could join his office. I guess he was impressed with my work. So what went through your mind when you ask you that? Um, if you think back about that moment. I didn't was. think that it, you know, I mean, you know, in politics, I'd been in politics for a long time. People say things, you know, and, and, and what you have to wait for is for the thing to come true. Because it's easy to say Which something. When was that? Huh? When was that? That's 1991. Which month? Do you know the month? 1990, actually, it's 1990. I think it was around September, okay. August, September, yeah. Seven months after you came out of prison? Yeah, I came out in February, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, what impressed him about you, other than the fact that you lived in America, that... I think is. that he, rec you know, I don't know, but in retrospect, I would say, because I think my whole career shows that, um, I think that he realized that I was a person who works in the background. I, I'm not one for the stage and, you know, to be seen, etc. I like to, not that I like to, my nature is to, to do work in the background. background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, um, and I think you'd be hard put, very hard put to find a photograph of me 
with Mr. Mandela, but I was chief of staff in his office. Uh, because I, I'm just not a camera lights person, you know. And I, I, he must have, because he was a very discerning, wise man, he must have noticed that, you know, and thought, this is the person that I, I will need. In. But also, as you can see, even from my interview with you, I'm not, uh, uh, I remain away from the camera because I'm actually a very passionate person. And I think you need calm, you know, collected people, you know, in front of the camera. Um, and, um, yeah. So. But passion drives people in terms of their own intellectual energy. Yes, yeah. but their own intellectual energy. But, uh, I mean, it's no good, uh, you know, uh, screaming at people on camera or wanting to beat them up or something like that. No, it doesn't work. You have to be able to be calm and, uh, and hide your true feelings. I'm not one who is able to hide my true feelings, but uh, that's why I work better, you know, in the background. So and what is the significance of, of working in the back room when you know you, you, you're dealing or you're serving and supporting an important leader like Nelson Mandela at the time? Well, I think it's, it's very important to realize in the first place that you are not Nelson Mandela, you know. If you work with the president or you work with a minister, you are not the minister. You are working, not we, I, I don't like the, the, the expression for, working for because I don't think I was working for him. I was working for the ANC. And uh, when you are working for your country or for your company, you know, or for your school, or, you know, you are working for, you know. And the person who has been chosen to lead, you, you are not that person. You, together with that person and others, are working to advance the cause of that institution, of that organization, etc. You know, and I think for me that is the most important thing. You know, because I think that, for instance, uh, in our country, we we've had this expression of Batubili, the people first. Uh, and I think much of the complaints that our people have is that the people are not always first. You know, because I'm holding a position in a I am first now, you know. I'm working in Mr. Mandela's office, so you have to go through Barbara, you know, and, you know, and Barbara, you know. When you work in a situation like that, you, you, first of all, you have to realize you can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. You need other people to work with. We, are, we live in a society which is very complex and which therefore has many discipline and many experts. You need those people. You need their wisdom. You need their advice, you need their input. And if you work in the back room, you have to be aware of the fact that there are other people out there who can make what you do look even better and be even better because they know about different subjects. I'll give you an example. Um, just before we went to elections, you know, uh, we were the there first, in the, the first, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it was very important that we should get everyone in South Africa to vote, to participate, to be part of the, this thing, to, of the campaign, uh, and to, to play a role. And one businessman, I wouldn't say he was a businessman, I would say he was associated with business, came to me to say to me, 
They want to see Mr. Mandela because they think it's very, very important that the physically challenged, the disabled South Africans should play a role in voting, you know. Um, and uh, so this was not a person who was an activist in the ANC, you know. And uh, so they were asking for, and I told Mr. Mandela, and he said, of course I'll see them. But what I'm, I'm getting at is that actually, at the time, I think it was maybe 15%, but it was like over 10% of the voters were disabled people. Now, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, what now, you know, and it's very fashionable now to, you know, to, 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 it's politically correct to incorporate everything. But in those days, it, you know, you know, you, you never thought about the power of disabled people in South Africa. Uh, and and uh, one of the reasons why I respect it Mr. Mandela, and I still do so much, is that he was an inclusive person. He, the most important thing for him, because he loved South Africa so much, was that everybody who can make an, a contribution to the betterment of our country must be utilized for that purpose. You know, which is not always true, you know. This is where you get, you know, this factionalism, you get this and that and that, you know. Mr. Mandela was very, very clear about the right of every South African to contribute to the betterment of the country, you know. So if you, you are a backroom person, you have to recognize that. You know. but, but isn't it a little bit romantic, can I put this proposition to you, is it conceivable that that, that is a tried and tested experience, or living experience that you had in the back room? Many people that works in back rooms and that works for important leaders sometimes see themselves almost like an extension yeah, of that officer of leadership. Yeah, of what is wrong with that? They're not an extension of that person. Because that person themselves that they are working for, that person himself is not there because they are better than others. They are there because they are going to best serve the interests of the people. You know, there's a whole thing about leadership. You have to have this and this and be like this, charismatic. The point is that you are there because you are supposed to be serving the people. And when you are not serving them anymore and you are serving yourself, then you must be out. You know, it's the cult. We never had the cult of leadership when we, we were growing up in, in the ANC. Never. It was never about Walter Sisulu or Oliver Tambo or, you know, whoever, or Nelson Mandela. And if you even remember the, the, the campaigns for the release of Mr. Nelson Mandela, they were for Nelson Mandela and all other political prisoners. He was merely a symbol chosen by the movement. Not because he was handsome or charismatic or, you know, eloquent, but because he was the person who was talented, had enough talent to do the best job to help the people of South Africa. Well, my last two questions is, is how did you, because you were also part of the Codesa negotiations, um, there was that particular day, the break, where President Mandela got onto the stage. 
and he was really angry with Evie the Clerk in the National Party at the time um, and expressing certain views. What was the mood at that moment? Because there were lots of speculations that that, that could be the total break of constitutional negotiations. I think that Mr. Mandela was one of the most disciplined people I, 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 I have known in my life because he was not only disciplined, he was disciplined in his personal life, you know, uh, uh, in terms of his physical life. He exercised, you know, took, you know, some form of exercise. He didn't overeat. He, he took care of, because he was a vessel in the service of the people. And if that vessel breaks down, then it can't serve the people anymore. So, um... And in public, I mean, he was the epitome of diplomacy and, and you know, uh, wit and all of that, loved, you know. Um, and I think for me, the realization was that what had happened was so profound, was so was so deep that for that moment he could not be the affable Mr. Nice Guy, you know. He, it, it was a, a critical moment, you know. It was not rehearsed, but he recognized that, you know, he could not let the dignity of the suffering people of South Africa be, uh, what is the word, be diminished, you know, in that fashion. You know, and, and, and that, it was a, a moment in history. I don't remember it happening publicly. I mean, Mr. Mandela would get very upset about the people of South Africa and how they were treat, being treated. Like when, for instance, um, when, when there were all these massacres taking place, you know, uh, working with him, you would see that his, he was grieving, his heart was bleeding. But that was in private in the office. Uh, but uh, for him to lose his temper publicly like that, you realize that it was not, what is the word? It was not a, 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 an act of, uh, um, what is the word? What is the English? It was not the, a, 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 the act of somebody who was being, um, you know, uh, come on, tell me the word, who, who, who was being glib. Let's say, although it's not the correct word, he was not being glib. He was not grandstanding. Something had pricked him deeply. And um, here I think one has to say that, you know, this is a man who never showed the wounds, the, the psychic wounds that he had suffered from being incarcerated for such a long time. But I think that was probably one moment when he was angry, you know. But I've, because otherwise he was the most, uh, you know, controlled and affable person, you know. Looking back, over the years, and the different leaders that you worked with, you yourself a backroom leader in terms of supporting and assisting and making sure that South Africans get served, all of South Africans. What are the three 
lessons from that experience. Will you tell South Africa current South African leaders, people that wants to across the political spectrum, people that wants to get into leadership position, children that are dreaming of being a leader and serving whatever particular area of the professional and political outlook. What would be the key three lessons that you will tell? I think that first and foremost, you must have a vision. And that vision must be informed by reality. And that reality must be the reality of the people you serve, whether it's in the company or, you know, whatever, you know, or in your political party or in your community. But you must, if you don't have a vision, forget it. You must have a vision and that vision must be informed by the reality, the objective reality, not your reality, not the reality of your neighbors only, not the, re the reality, you know, of, of the movie star that you like. It must be your, the real, the genuine reality. And you can only, you know, fulfill that vision if you are inclusive because you must listen to everybody. You must listen to everybody and listen carefully and take, you know, and let them tell because it's about them, you know. Um, and finally, I would say that, um, you know, you must be inclusive must be inclusive. You must even involve people you don't like because they might have something to, to, to give you, you know. And in any, in any situation, there is always a devil's advocate who is irritating, but you must listen. You must not exclude anybody, ever. I have to ask you this because you raised it. The issue of factions. Mm -hmm. The issue of factions. You were saying that, there's, that there was no factions in the past to the extent that you currently have in political parties or within... There are always factions. There's never in any, you know, in any political situation. What is wrong with factions now? The, your, your... The, they are always... Uh, uh, you know, I think that <clears throat> for me, what got us to where we, 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 we got liberation was that we didn't have a cult. Nobody ever became, you know... Uh, I mean, you know, Walter Sisulu. And you know, when you talk about those people, you always talk about them in a group. Yeah. You know, always. You, you, you never talk about, you know. Uh, and to me, that's the most important thing, to realize that um, um, everybody is important. So no personality counts. Yeah. It was about... It was about... It, it was about values, ideals, aspirations only. Only. It's not about elevating so and so to that station of power or, you know, no. Never. Is it time for a South African woman president? It's always time for a South African woman president. I think that, um, uh, you know, I mean, growing up in the movement and even living, being an ambassador of South Africa, you know, going to the UN, going to international conferences, it still makes me ill when I, all, I see all those men in dark suits, you know. Of course, it's, it's time for a South African, uh, but it's also time, 
how shall I put it? It's not a question of gender only. It's, it's, it's a question of we believe that a woman can make as much contribution to the improvement of South Africa as any man. And we are, you know, equal to that. It would be great if we had a woman president, not for the sake only of having a female president. We have to have the best person. And a, a woman should have a chance to compete with the best. That's how I'll put it. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Babu Nusakela, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Great.